From bell ringing lessons at a 12th century cathedral to a tour of the first hydroelectric plant in Ireland, Joe's in County Clare now for a truly electrifying lesser spotted journey. Lesser Spotted Journeys, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. What's called a haw haw. Oh, I know, I know what they are. And you know what a haw I know what oh, well, well, we, call, we call them a haw haw. <laughs> but I know that uh, because it originated in the French, it's called a haw haw. Oh. So again, the river was the reason that we brought to Indeed, you. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. You, you, you won't get a story in Killaloo and Ballina unconnected. unconnected to the River <laughs> Shannon. Right. Oh, look, there's a, there's a salmon just yeah. behind us there. Look, there, yeah. <laughs> it's performing for us. His brother Mahan was killed. Um, he ruled from Kildu as well. He was a great man. man. Yeah, great. <laughs> I'm not biased or anything. No. Ask, you know. no, I was wrong. No, you're wrong there. I was wrong there. I was doing so well. Yeah. I'll do the first bit. He was doing yeah. very well otherwise. All right. Yeah. The River Shannon flows through three great lakes on its 200 mile journey southward from Cavan to Limerick Loch Allen, Loch Ree, and Loch Derg. And just where the waters of Loch Derg decide to resume the journey as a river again, there was a crossing point, deemed narrow enough in ancient times for cattle to be driven across from the east bank to the west. Rarely would they have gone in the opposite direction, because these cattle would be tribute, paid to a great king by the clans who sought his protection and acknowledged his leadership. The Irish word for such tribute was Baru, and that became the title of the greatest of all Irish high kings. The one who built his royal palace here, and who made this small village, for a brief but glorious spell in its long history, the political capital of Ireland. Welcome to Killaloo, on the west bank of the River Shannon in County Clare. Local people may well be exchanging wry smiles by now, because they will have been instantly aware that I was issuing a welcome to County Clare on the west bank of the Shannon, while actually standing in the county temporary town of Ballina on the east bank. The river is the march between the two counties at this point, and the twin towns of Killadoo and Ballina are linked by a long bridge of many arches and a long tradition of rivalry, which is nowadays confined to the sporting field for the most part anyway. County affiliations are often most keenly felt and local identities most vigorously asserted at the age of adjoining territories. Nonetheless, the inescapable truth is that Killaloo is viewed to best advantage with its natural ally, the Shannon in the foreground, from the opposite bank of the river. It's 12th century cathedral dominating the skyline and keeping a sentinel watch on a mix of early medieval and modern construction in the mazy streets below its parapets. The River Shannon takes on many forms befitting its many functions, and as you leave its banks to enter Killaloo, there's still a canal to negotiate before you begin the ascent of the narrow meandering thoroughfare, which thankfully has survived the perils of 20th century planning to retain all of the charming inconvenience of its medieval character. At the summit, where now stands the Catholic Church, is the ancient site of Brian Baru's royal palace of Kinkora, his seat of power and the foundation of Killaloo's claim to fame as the political capital of Ireland a thousand years ago. We'll return inevitably to Brian Baru and Kinkora a little later. For now, I'm making a strategic retreat back to Ballina, for it's here that James Whelan docks his boat and it's from here that he embarks upon the Shannon with visitors who will soon count themselves fortunate to have explored the area in the company of such a knowledgeable and personable native guide. I'm starting with the very basic navigation details that Loch Derg's less than a mile to the north and Limerick City 
is somewhere to the south. To Limerick City, about 10 miles. And that's for the by river. By river. And that's where the water changes in. It becomes tidal. And it's very, very different when you get to Limerick because the water really does speed up. If the power stations start to generate electricity, it can be very, very fast. Tides don't affect this far Not up, no. one bit. We no. have the best stretch of water in the whole Shannon. You would Bec- say that, of course. Of course <laughs> I would, yeah. But uh, the hills even, the hills over my shoulder, yeah. they go to about 530 metres. Mm. And in the worst of a southwesterly wind, the lake, the lower end of the lake, can be like a, a sheet of glass. So the river is probably the reason why either of these towns was put For here in the very first place. For certain, yeah. Way ago, like, probably thousands of years. All thousands of years, yeah. And then Killaloo got its name in the 7th century from a saint who came to live on Friars Island, which is now submerged because of the power station. Is there no sign of Friars Island there? None whatsoever, all? none no, whatsoever. Right. There is a monument on the roadside, but that's it. Well, we're talking about another, you know, other landmarks along the way. And uh, you mentioned this place here, which is, uh, you tell me that was an old mill. That's right, an old marble mill, would you believe, for milling marble. They use the power of the water to run machinery to cut rock, marble rock, into uh, monuments and dairy slabs. And that goes back to the year 1832. And if you go into the cathedral behind us and you read the inscription on some of the slabs and the monuments that are in there, it'll say, made at Killaloo Marble Works. And that was back in the 1830s? 1830s. How did the place here end up making marble? Was the marble brought in from somewhere else? It, w- it would have been, but you see you had the combination of two things. You had the drop in the river here right. to turn the mill wheel, ah. but then obviously marble being such a heavy commodity, you had the canal on the other side of the mill, and the marble came up from Limerick Docks along the canal, and then even put a cut from the canal back into the marble yard for the canal boats and then it could be hauled into the yard and worked on. So again, the river was the reason that was brought indeed, here. Indeed, right. indeed. Uh, you, you, you won't get a story in Killaloo and Ballina unconnected. <laughs> unconnected to the River <laughs> Shannon. Right, okay, so that obviously became obsolete whenever the water level Unfortunately, got so high. Yes. You don't fall anymore. No, in 1929, but the miller was compensated. The power company then, they bought out the mill, and thankfully there are still men working there today. It's, oh a, really? it's a workshop belonged to the power company. Oh, I see, right, right. but it's not cutting any more marble, no, no, unfortunately. unfortunately. Right. And there's a few other landmarks along here. Well, we, we know about the cathedral, obviously. Yeah. But down here, there's a wee footbridge. That's right, yeah. Across what used to, The railway used to go down there. Directly in front of us, the railway line ran there. It opened in 1865, and it ran successfully right into the 1920s and 30s, and the last train left in the 40s with a couple of derelict carts. Yeah. But when the railway line was built initially, they blocked access from Ballina Town down to the river bank. And the local women were not at all happy about that because the river was where they would wash their clothes. Oh. And the first train that came into town, we had a, a case of uh, women's rights being worked on here in Killaloo when the ladies came and they sat on the track. Industrial action. Industrial action. By the washerwomen. By the washerwomen right. of the town. And to appease the washerwomen, then the railway company built the railway footbridge over the track and it's forever known as the Washerwoman's Bridge. The Washerwoman's Bridge. That's so right. the river was also a part of <laughs> back to the Back to the river again. It was. The river was part of that story because it they needed the water to wash their clothes. Exactly, that? exactly. But also the train that came out from Limerick along the line here, yeah. a lot of the passengers would have been coming to Killaloo to get on pleasure boats right. and to go up the River Shannon. And the, the fare included a trip on a boat up Loch Derg. And that was the reason the train came here. Because it didn't go anywhere else. No, it was, it was the, the end of line. It was the end of line, yeah. Right, right. So we've brought all these. Pol- so really, you're carrying on in that tradition. I am. I am. I'm a bit later than what those guys were doing, and yeah. we would uh, have a bit more modern of a boat. But you mean the draw, the attraction of the river, and the attraction of Loch Derg? Mm. It's been there for over 200 years. So you have to acquaint yourself with an awful lot of re- a range of topics. You would, including you would. all the history. Yeah, it's easy when you've grown up in a town. It's very easy when you have grown up in a town. So you, you, you didn't have to sit down at some stage consciously and read up and bone up on all your facts and your dates. And I would just keep the dates right you because dates right. are important. Yeah. But you know, my dad has a grocery shop in Killaloo now for 51 years. So uh, the trading in the town is something we've done that length. And I worked before I worked on the boats. I worked in his shop, so I know what Killaloo and Ballina are like for going back now almost. Uh, well, well, you, s- it's like you said to me earlier on, I was working in the shop that gave you the idea of doing this in the first place. Indeed, yeah. Because yeah. people kept asking, you know, can we not get a boat out Exactly, the yeah. Like we that? have a lovely ice cream machine and we're well known for lovely ice creams and constantly people coming in, you know, is there any way of getting out on the river? And back in 1991, when I was just 15, my father pushed me out of the shop and onto a boat and I never looked back. And you've been doing that ever since? Indeed, yeah. So you started doing this when you were 15? 15, 15 with a small little boat with just four people in it with no cover, so any wet day it was a cold day. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's grown ever since. But I mean, it's a beautiful situation. You've got, you've got um, Killaloo on that side, and of course it's County Clare. Yep. And you have Ballina on this side, it's County Tipperary. Now, 
There's a rivalry between these two Huge teams. rivalry, <laughs> huge rivalry. And I'm glad to say that that's the only bridge between Killaloo and Ballina, the only bridge that links County Clare with County Tipperary. Right. And if you look at it, sections of that bridge got swept away in a flood in the 1840s. Right. And it was the Tipperary people who wanted it to be put back because they liked being connected to the good people of Clare. But the Clare people weren't so keen on having it built back. Right, you're, not, you're the only joke, of course, aren't you? I'm dead serious. <laughs> <laughs> And so the legendary rivalry between the good people of Killaloo and the equally good people of Ballina, no doubt, is stoked up yet again. As we travel southwards away from Loch Derg, I am marking out a spot on the west bank to my left because that's my next destination. Under those tall trees, the original Bale Baru, when we come back. Lesser Spotted Journeys, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. Herbal Essences invites you into the mystical jungle. Shroud your senses in a delicate veil of coconut kisses. Dive into a bottomless lagoon of moisture, the essence of follicular vitality. Take your hair to paradise. Introducing a new dimension to driving pleasure. Performance guaranteed to cut your fuel costs. Contoured custom fitted interior with integrated broadband connectivity. 25 major routes express connected through the day every day. And you can even sleep while you're on the road. Expressway. Like the car, only better. Did you know Barcelona has a four kilometer long beach? That's a lot of beach for little legs. Book your flight and hotel together now and save on worldwide destinations with Expedia.ie. If you only have time for one magazine this week, catch up with Donald Skeen untying the knot and feeling ready to be a dad. Saoirse Ronan tells all about the Oscar-buzzed movie Brooklyn and her mother's real-life story. And create the perfect festive season with our free mini ICA Book of Christmas. RTE Guide. Grab life by the pages. The Nissan Pulsar is built around you. With great features available like forward emergency braking, it has all the technology you need, exactly when you need it. Available from €20,695, Nissan. You'll never look back. Sarah loves waffles. Lily loves berries. It's croissants and crepes for Ali and Jerry. Just when Nutella couldn't get any better, we put all your names on it. Letter by letter. Put your name on it and have your Nutella your way. What do you do to reveal your underarms? Just shave. But shaving can cause irritation. Delft Compressed contains one quarter moisturizing cream to help skin recover. So for beautiful underarms, just use Dove. All the care of Dove in a compressed can. Uncle John hated everything about Christmas. Well, not quite everything. Share a little bit of magic with friends and family this Christmas. Introducing the Expressway Seat Sale on more than 20 major routes for just $7.99 one way. Buy your ticket online before midnight November 30th. 5 a.m. We're still out. And it's my period. But here I am, best night ever. New Always Ultra, unlike this fluff-filled pad, has a core with liquid locking gel that can't leak. Here's to staying out till sunrise. Up to 100% leak protection. Clean, dry, fresh. Always. Spotted Journeys, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes.
Brian Baru's reign as High King of Ireland lasted for 12 years, from 1002 until his death in 1014, when his armies famously defeated the Vikings at the Battle of Clontarf. In the year 2002, the Irish Postal Service and Post issued a series of stamps to mark the thousandth anniversary of Brian's accession to the High Kingship and commissioned artist Finbar O'Connor to depict scenes from Brian's life. This image is of Brian seated in his royal palace at Kilcora here in Killaloo, where the Catholic Church now stands. Kinkora means head of the weir, and from this summit, Brian and his successors, the Clan O'Brien Kings, would have had a commanding view of the river below. But that also meant that the enemies of the O'Briens would have had a very clear view of their target, Kinkora. The builders and the repairmen must have been on more or less permanent standby at Kinkora for much of its existence, because there cannot have been a building at any time in the entire history of the country that was attacked and destroyed and rebuilt so often. Brian Baru made it his royal palace in the year 1002, and just 14 years later, two years after his famous victory and death at the Battle of Clontarf, it was attacked and burnt to the ground by the clans of Connacht. But over the next hundred years, it was attacked and destroyed on no less than seven more occasions, once by lightning, but most often by the O'Connors, who seemed to have taken a spite against the place. The worst occasion was probably in 1062, when E. O'Connor added insult to injury by not only sacking the palace, but also feasting upon the two sacred salmon that were kept in a pool inside Kinkora. The sacred salmon, bounty of the Shannon of course, had long been revered as symbols of wisdom and knowledge by the Delcassian tribe, of which Brian Baru, as King of Munster, was de facto leader. He had succeeded his elder brother Mahan, who had been the first king of Munster. And for all that they were professed Christians, they would still have been steeped in the ancient lore and belief of their ancestors. Brian himself would have been a firm believer in Eivor the Banshee, the fairy goddess who guided the fortunes of the Delacassians, and who lived at the top of Crag Hill, which overlooks this earthen fort, less than a mile upstream from Killaloo, just where the Shannon emerges from Loch Derg to become recognisable as a river again. This is Bail Baru, the place from which Brian and indeed his brother Mahan before him derived their title. It's also the place where I've arranged to meet local historian Una Kearse to find out more about the man who broke the stranglehold of the O'Neills and moved the hay kingship of Ireland from Tara to Killaloo. Well, really, he, he, but he, he put Killaloo on the map, so to speak. Right? He did, right, certainly. Because if I'm having my palace here, I'm from here, I'm, I'm a proud monster man, and right. this, is, this is where my palace is Absolutely, to be. he was certainly a local man. He grew up here, he was born here in 941. He may have gone to maybe even Clamacnoid to be educated for a few years in between, um, but as king of, of Munster, which he followed on after, or he, mm. which he attained after his brother Mahan was killed, um, he ruled from Kildu as well. He was a great man, Mahan. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. I'm not biased or anything no. like that, you know. But that was his older brother and he was killed. That was his older brother. It was really only because he was killed that Brian came, into, came to the fore, really, I suppose. Absolutely. Brian had a lot of older brothers, but some of them were killed and some of them were abbots and monasteries, so they wouldn't have been in line for succession. The uh, astonishing thing, they were, probably Brian Brew's greatest achievement was living to the age that he did, given the times that were well, Absolutely, given the, the hard life that he had Aye. and the, the battles, I suppose, that he was involved in. Um, yes, he was an old man. He was 73 by the time of the Battle of Clontarf. And he, he didn't actually lead the Dalcassian forces at, at Clontarf, but he did go to Clontarf. His eldest son, Murra, led the troops on, on that occasion. And, of course, Murra was one of the casualties, as was Murra's son. So, so really... At the Battle of Clontarf, we lost Brian Brew, and he's next in line. So three generations. So three generations, really. really yeah. right. Well, listen, this is very intriguing because we've got this big mound here behind us. I know that this is of Norman construction is, yes, here, yes. what we see at the present time, but is there something to be seen? If there, is climb a, up it's that? there is certainly. It's, there's a hollow um, on, on the far side of that mound. But it's a beautiful spot. It, right. If you knew nothing about the history, it's a gorgeous spot. Lots of people by the looks of things have clambered up there. Is, yeah, that, is, do, that, yeah. is that the recommended route for well, you? You can picture children coming up here. Right. That's, that's the way they go. Is there a more leisurely route into there it? There is a more leisurely <laughs> route. route, 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 route around the side? Around this All right, we'll go that way. We don't mind. Una has been familiar with Bale Baru and the surrounding area throughout her childhood. But I suspect she would have been more aware of its significance than her peers because she would have learnt a great deal from her father, the esteemed Killaloo historian, Sean Kearse. 
he would have filled her head with stories of an earlier fort at Green and Lachna on the lower slopes of Crag Hill, of the Banshee Evil who haunted its upper heights, and the other places whose names would have been familiar to the Delcassians a thousand years ago. Further over there too, there was a, um, a field called Park Nignac where, where they kept their horses. Right. So it was a big kind of settlement, really. It this, was, this was only the centre part. This of was it. only yes. This was probably just the centre part. It was where they manned. The idea of being here was to control movement on the river. I see. So this was a sentinel looking out over the traffic yeah, outside out there. Over. And you're standing back in those days. Of course, the, the, the Shannon would have been much shallower. Well, right at Killaloo, it was a lot shallow, shallower. Um, right. You couldn't navigate from Limerick to Killaloo back then, which is why the canal was built much later. Now the canal opened in 1799. Right but try to visualise the Vikings making their way from their base at Limerick, trying to get right into the heart of the country. They had to use the River Shannon as, their, as the artery. Um, but they'd come as far as Castle Connell, where they met rapids in shallower water, so they had to leave the water. They'd leave the water with their boats, carry them, and make their way along here. Hills around here were heavily forested, and to try to get their boats back into the deep water. So they carried those big long boats yeah, on, the, on their shoulders. <laughs> right. They must have been pr pretty, pretty yeah. anxious to get a raid going. So, I mean, there was no obstacle that they could not overcome, in other words? Oh, perfectly yeah. not, yeah. Okay, so this, uh, also because this was the shallow part of the river, this is where the, 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 the kind of the fording place, where yes. they drove cattle across. Yes, and uh, that's where the word Boru came from. So, Brian Boru, Boru is not a surname. The word Boru literally means um, tribute or cattle tribute or tax. I'd say there'd be one way traffic as well, <laughs> most of it, wouldn't it? Because exactly, there were very yeah. few tributes paid the paid other, the other way. way. Yeah. There are associations as well, of course, with, with the, the mythology of, oh, of yes, that yeah, whole period, yeah, yeah. as well as the history uh, of that. And there are lots of myths associated with Brian Baru. And with the Banshee, or Evil, um, who, who's also associated with, with, the, with Craig Hill behind our backs here, was, um, I suppose, loved by the Dalcassian and believed in by, by the Dalcassian tribe. And it's said that she appeared to Brian Baru the night before he died at Clontarf, at Clontarf. and foretold his death. But all this time, you know, if you mentioned Brian Brady to somebody in the country and they say, oh, I Claude Tarf's that. Oh, like yeah, Claude and that's... <laughs> you know, wait for us. For us. They only spent, yeah. as you say, a couple of days yeah. there. <laughs> Here's where he spent his entire life. And, and we spent a lot of time last year in 2014 commemorating not just the millennium of his death, but the, I suppose, the end as well of, of his reign as High King, because he reigned here for 12 years between 1002 and 1014. So for, for that period of time, Killaloo was the equivalent of the capital of the country. It was certainly the seat of power. It was, you know, It's where things happened. Was there, a, was there a special kind of celebration? There were, we had celebrations there? year round here, but there were also celebrations. We worked a lot with our, uh, some of our colleagues in Clontarf and Cashel and Armagh. Well, the colleagues now, aren't they? Yes, we were good friends around the country. Good, we did, good, right. um, and had some fun as well. Even in 1116, just over a hundred years after Brian Baru's death, Turlock O'Connor of Connacht attacked and burned the O'Brien stronghold here at Bale Baru. And three years later, in 1119, he finally destroyed Kincora, dismantling its timbers and stones and throwing them into the Shannon. The same year saw the death of the man who is thought to have built the miraculously preserved St. Flannan's Oratory here at Killaloo. He was Brian Baru's descendant, Murroch Mor O'Brien the last of that name to hold the High Kingship of Ireland, and the last also to hold the Kingship of Munster outright. By the time Donald Moore O'Brien built the original St. Flannan's Cathedral at Killaloo in the late 12th century, he was King of Thomond, because the Treaty of Glanmire in 1118 had divided Munster. The Kingdom of Thomond, or North Munster, ruled by the O'Briens, with South Munster, or Desmond, conceded to the McCarthys. Donald's original building was destroyed in 1185 by, predictably, the men of Connacht. But the beautiful Irish Romanesque doorway from that building was preserved and incorporated into the 13th century St. Flannan's Cathedral, which has been the Church of Ireland Cathedral since the Reformation. Remarkably, the name of the first Protestant bishop in 1576 was O'Brien. Brian Bridgelane was the organist here for many years, and he delights in showing visitors its various treasures, of which the centerpiece is, of course, that doorway. You'd like to think that in the 21st century, the cathedral's treasures are now safe from marauders. Not so, according to Brian, as you'll soon hear. And, uh, the parts of it that were really worn out, so to speak, they had rotten away was that pillar there. So that's that's renewed since 2000. 
and was rather rotting like uh, it has been there. Do you see it? You kind see of it yeah. flaking away. Yeah, but that, that will be there for another 100 years or so anyway before oh, or that no. needs replacement. Right. <laughs> it's amazingly beautifully decorated, it is. isn't it? You know, I mean, the it is, yeah. And that was all done. You can picture a mask That's right. a thousand years ago with Correct. the tiny, tiny That's chisel right. in his hand. Yeah, well, one day a pair came in from America with a hammer and chisel. <laughs> they wanted to, to take bits of it back to the States. You're not hammer, serious. Yeah, I am. Hammer and chisel <laughs> working away on the stonework. Some, luckily, <laughs> before they started, a parishioner came in and caught them. Seriously? Yeah, that's right. Hammer and chisel. <laughs> so the, the, the vandals, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the Vikings are still, are still <laughs> going around the place. They were. Still plundering they were. away. That's right. They Good wanted Lord. to take bits of it back to the States as a souvenir. So hopefully so it'll be still here another thousand years. Well, I hope so. Well. I won't be anyway. Well, I don't think either of us will. But here, th th this is a lovely atmospheric. Uh, it is. Uh, part well, of, of course, the acoustics here are brilliant. They're even more brilliant here than they are down there. So if you say anything here, do your words reverberate they for do. about half they an do. hour? <laughs> they do. Yeah. We had a choir down from Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin there not too long ago, and they had d divided the concert into two. Mm. First part was down the far end, yeah. east end, and the second part was played here. And uh, it was mm. brilliant. The organist, uh, or the choir master at the time, said it was better down here than it was up there. Really? Yeah. Because of the acoustics. Because of the acoustics, yeah. yeah it is wonderful. Yeah. So, but we're standing in a place now that's in its own right. This was built around something late 1100. Oh, it was 1185, yeah. 1185, yeah. Right. yeah. Stone and space and time have all combined to form this ancient acoustic. And you can imagine it still reverberating with the faintest of echoes from centuries past. It's a space that houses artefacts that are themselves hundreds of years apart. A stone that bears both Owen script and Scandinavian runes, telling us that Thorgrim carved this and that it was once a cross a thousand years ago. This is still a cross from the 12th century, at which point in time it stood in a forest of such crosses in Kilfenora to the north of here. The baptismal font with the intricately carved cross and foliage design is a mere youngster from the 13th century. Brian pointed out all these and other treasures as we entered through the 19th century oak screen to view the towering delicacy of the east window. But for all that he enjoys sharing his knowledge and his own appreciation of St. Flannan's, his eyes lit up and he had me practically sprinting up the tower when I asked to see the famous cathedral bells. Now, Brian, when you said to me that we're going to go up and see the cathedral bells, I must say I'm very disappointed in the size of them. I was expecting huge, big, big, big <laughs> bells. But of course, these aren't. The these are hand bells. These are hand yeah, bells. Yeah, correct. They're very, I mean, they're very pretty and they're very colourful. They do you, yeah, you, do you, you ring them like this? You, you no? can. No, you can ring them and press the button down. Ah. Yeah. Two. Yeah. It's stubborn, that it's one. Stubborn. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Just the dampness up here sticks them. Did you no. tell me you're missing one? We're here? missing one there. The f it, 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 yeah, it's broken. See, the top I, is broken. I have a tune. To, I wanted yeah. to play a certain tune. I know I can't do <laughs> you it. You can. No, you can do it in the tower. So Got no, it, got it, got like it, finally. Yeah, okay. Now, you're saying to me, there, there's two different kinds of bell ringing, yeah. right? Pretend I know nothing about bell ringing, which, yeah. is, which is very hard to do. Um, and there's peeling, you tell me, and there's chiming. Yeah, correct. Now, what's, what's, essentially, what's the difference? Well, the peeling, a bell is on a wheel and swings 360 degrees backwards and forwards. Yeah. And one person has control of it. I see. And the rope, comes down to the, yeah, the rope comes down to the centre. And chiming. Chiming is... This system here. So a hammer just hammer hit hammer hits the side. I you see. can see them upstairs. Right. Four, four, eight, seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I've been wrong. No, you're wrong there. there. I was yeah, wrong no, there. yeah. I was, doing, again. I was doing so well. Yeah. I'll do the first. We're doing w very well otherwise. All right. Yeah. Shh. No. You have to wait until they stop. Oh, they stop. They reverberate forever, don't there they? There is. Right, I'll, start yeah. I'll start again. Right. Yeah. This one. That didn't sound right. Yeah, you did. So yeah, it was okay. Right. Yeah.
Grant. <laughs> Grant. No. That wasn't bad. That no, was, I, yeah. I, 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 the trick okay. of the course. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's absolutely no proper <laughs> speed or rhythm to that whatsoever. No, but you, you had the rhythm right at the beginning. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was straightforward. 4-4 four, four time, if you like. Right. Yeah. So there you are. Uh, I'll do a few changes for you. Do, do okay. a few changes, please. Yeah. Ryan's changes still ringing in our ears, we climbed finally out onto the roof of the Cathedral Tower, which offers a panoramic view of Killaloo, Ballina and the Shannon. You can also see the former Bishop's residence at Clarisfort House and Clarisfort Park nearby. That's another place where they're ringing in the changes, as we'll discover when we come back. Our free mini ICA book of Christmas. RTE Guide. Grab life by the pages. Girls, look at this. Destitute. That is what happens if you don't work hard. Parents, Wednesday at 8 on UTV Island. Lesser Spotted Journeys, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. Very shortly now, I'll be drifting southwards with the River Shannon, because down there, I'm told, there be giants. But before I leave the leafy banks of Killaloo and Ballina, there's one important call I still have to make. Up to now, we've been dwelling on the rich history of the Twin Towns, and the many reasons for celebrating their shared past. Well, here are a few reasons to celebrate what locals believe will be a very bright future for the whole community regardless of class, creed, colour, gender, age, or which bank of the river you come from. Clarisford Park was formerly 10 hectares of the domain of the Bishop's Palace that stretched luxuriantly along the Shannon to the south of Killaloo. And it's currently being transformed into a state-of-the-art sport and recreation complex, complete with playing fields, running and walking trails, and facilities that will accommodate every age and interest group. And crucially, all this has to be accomplished without compromising the status of Clarenceford Park as part of the Lower Shannon Special Area of Conservation. Josh Lowry is one of the activists on the Killaloo Community Development Group, which has harnessed the goodwill and the energies of a range of organisations, businesses and individuals in order to make this all possible. Joss is a retired forester himself and as such is acutely aware of the way this scheme would be seen to impact on such a beautiful and sensitive environment. As you have said yourself, it's such a beautiful place and where it's located that we spent a considerable time pre-planning. We had to do uh, archaeological surveys, uh, ec ecological surveys and we had to employ up to seven professionals before we could go to planning. And as I truly say, Josh, that this is really intended for every single age group in the community. Did you, when you were doing your planning, is that what you were trying to, trying to accommodate it, everybody? Absolutely. It is. That was the key word in the whole project, was it should be in an intergenerational ah. activity area. Right. And it, it, it will embrace just the area that we're walking through at the moment is an area dedicated to the Boy Scouts, the local troop here. Sorry, not Boy Scouts, Scouts. Right. Uh, and uh, th that is their area. They have about a hectare and a half for camping and all of that. Right. But they are, believe it or not, as small as a town, the twin towns of Ballina and Kildunit, they're the sixth largest troop of Scouts in Ireland. Really? So, and they had no home, so we've accommodated them with a home. But it will, it's catering for every generation. So it's a real, real asset to the town, to the two towns, really. To the twin towns, the yeah, twin absolutely. Towns, right. Though the funding mainly came uh, from uh, the Clare Local Development Company because mm. the asset here is based in County Clare. Talking about assets, one of the great assets you had here, or still have here, was Keith Wood. He was yeah. one of the main men to unlock a lot of this, isn't that the case? Yes, well, I think Keith contributed as much to Carlsford Park 
as he contributed to Ireland in the Lions. Well, that's a lot. And that's a lot. And he continues to take an interest in the place as well. Oh, absolutely. We call we refer to him as the boss, <laughs> even though he's not the chairman. Yeah, he's always yeah. the chairman. But the whole part has been the catalyst mm. of a new generation of athletes, for in instance, there's an athletic club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There has started a triathlon club. They train down here. So th it is huge. You're going to be the fittest people, the fittest <laughs> population anywhere in the country. <laughs> All right. You're excused because you're, you <laughs> know, my age. We're, we're, no, we've got, we got to. We got well, old props always carries our weight. Are you going to make sure anyway that these youngsters know a bit about trees before it's all over as well? Because uh, you've got a beautiful asset in that regard here as well, isn't that the case? Yeah, and we've tried to preserve the. Well, that would be one of the things we had to do before we went for planning also a tree survey. Right. And we have some very interesting bits and pieces. Mm. And as we walk along here, we are beginning to approach what looked like a stone wall right, but in wall. fact it's not a stone wall it's what's called a haw haw oh i the know what i know what they are and you know what i know what uh, oh, well, well, we, call, we call it a ha ha <laughs> but i know that uh, because it originated in the french it's called a ha ha oh. <laughs> yes so a false it, a, yes, a, a it, false surface almost. it was a, a formal type jar, not a real, for, an informal jar, yeah. and so they, uh, they, it's really a dry moat. It was to keep so animals out of the place. It was. Joss and I could happily discuss the proper pronunciation of ha-has or ha-has for some time, but I have an appointment to keep further down the Shannon. One final visit in relation to that, though, before I depart Killadoo. This is what remains of St. Malou's Oratory, the little prayer chapel named after the saint from whom the village, the parish, and indeed the whole diocese of Killaloo derived their name. Apart from the chancel here, which was added a bit later, the rest of it's in a pretty ruined state, more so than you might expect for a building that was only erected here in 1930. But of course, this is not where it was originally built. For more than a thousand years, it stood on a little island called Inishlua in the middle of the River Shannon, about a kilometre downstream from Killaloo. And when it was realised that the waters of the Shannon hydroelectric scheme would completely submerge the island, every single stone was removed and rebuilt here, almost exactly as it would have looked on Inishlua. Which demonstrates two things. How much they value their heritage in these parts, and secondly, how important the Shannon hydroelectric scheme was to the rest of the country. By any standard, the Shannon hydroelectric scheme was, in every sense, a colossal undertaking. In the early 1920s, only the citizens of Dublin and Cork and the fledgling Free State had any access to electricity. The idea of harnessing the energy of the Shannon to bring light to the rest of the country by building a hydroelectric plant here at Ardna Crusha was the brainchild of Dr. Thomas McLaughlin, a physicist and electrical engineer from Drogheda who worked for the German firm of Siemens Schuckart and who became, in 1927, the first managing director of the ESB, the Electricity Supply Board. From the rooftop of St. Flannan's Cathedral, you can just about make out the reason why the river now flows more deeply through Killaloo. The hydroelectric scheme involved raising the level of the Shannon by 10 metres, diverting most of the flow into a head-raised canal that stretched for over 12 kilometres from Park Team Weir down to Ardna Crusha, where massive iron pipelines fed the water to a series of turbines in the powerhouse, generating electricity, which then had to be distributed around the country. At the peak of its construction, it employed some 5,000 people, building the dams, digging out the headrace, constructing four major bridges and diverting nine other rivers. It cost the government of the day 20% of its entire annual budget. But when it was completed in 1929, it was able to supply over 80% of the country's needs and was hailed at the time as the biggest hydroelectric scheme in the world. Nowadays, the output of Ardna Crusha represents only 2% of the nation's needs. And as another measure of how much the world has changed, Alan Bain, the current plant manager, shows me the original control room, whose functions today can be carried out by one man and a computer. Oh, this is uh, amazing. Look at this. is like uh, the control room of the Starship Enterprise, or Dr. Nose Lair, you know, <laughs> something like that. 
But uh, there's uh, this is this is the original control yeah, room. This is, we just refer to it as the old control room. It's I suppose it was used up until the late nineties. I know. When I we, yeah, yeah, yeah. When we, when we moved into a new control room. But all these dials and all these switches and all and everything else go back to 1930. Yeah. yeah. So this is this was this, this was state of the art. Oh yeah, definitely at that stage. At that yeah. time. Mm. And does all this still work? No. None of it at all. Not since the mid 90s, we've transferred to the other control room. Right, right. So it's just lying there. Yeah, it's actually it's a museum piece. Essentially, essentially, that's what we do. Yeah. I right. mean, when people come to visit, we just show them what we show them what how it used to be. How it used to be. You, you must never get rid of it because this is no. good, this is. You could have a, this is a film set or something around yeah. as well. Really yeah. atmospheric. The basic principle of the scheme, Alan assures me, is simple and remains unchanged. The turbines receiving the water convert the flow energy into rotation energy, which drives the generators. It's the scale of the operation and the task of maintaining its massive components that tends to make us mere mortals feel really mere. Here, for instance, is the lock that allows boats to negotiate the Shannon from the tail race up to the head race. Basically, they, if they're coming from, that brings you down to Limerick. Right. So if you're coming from Limerick, you're coming up through, you sail into the lock here, we fill it, then you go underneath where we're standing, and you go out through the, you come up to the top lock, so and you go up, so up, up the canal. You put it very simply, the water's at two different yeah. levels, and yeah. the levels, the difference is about 90 yeah, 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 give or take, yeah, yeah. About, about, right? It takes quite a bit of time to go from the bottom to the top. Right. You know. So if I was in a boat down there, how long would I be sitting on my boat? It could be an hour and a half or so. Really? As long yeah, as that? Right? It, it, it can be done, it can be be done, done faster, but more yeah, dangerous, yeah, looks yeah, like yeah. here. We, so generally, it's an hour and a half. Like. When boats do reach the upper level, they'll find themselves in a very different river environment. Man-made banks cropped by sheep who've been tasked by the ESB with keeping the grass down for ease of maintenance. It's worth reminding ourselves, although the term wasn't invented back in the 1930s, that the power generated here is green energy. And that green energy requires careful negotiation with the ESB's partner in this scheme, nature. So you have to keep you have to keep topped up to a certain height. Is that the idea? Yeah, we, we maintain within a certain certain levels. Right. So we can't go above. We can't go below. So you have two units going now at the moment, yeah. right? And two, so two are not going. Is that Correct. the idea? Yeah, yeah. So what decides you whether or not uh, to have what, all four going or what, not? I suppose what decides really is how much rainfall has happened and is predicted. I can't believe you haven't got all four going all the time because no, of the weather yeah. we had this week. But that's that's. I mean, you, you don't judge it like no, that. You have, you have to I be careful. And I suppose the other side of it is, George, that say if it rains up in Loch Allen, mm. it takes a couple of days for that water to actually get get ah, as far as here. Right. So at the, when it first opened, and I think this is the important thing to, to remember about the history of this place, outside of Dublin and Cork, the rest of the country really no, had no access to electricity. No. I suppose, I mean, this was the first two units, our first three units were commissioned in 29, 1929. And also, as part of building here, Siemens also installed the the overhead lines we built on here from the point of view of rural electrification, and then we built other hydro locations, the Liffey first, and then the urn, and and something like was it about? Oh look, there's a there's a salmon just jumped yeah. behind us there. Look, there, yeah. <laughs> he's performing for us. He's looking to see who's that talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So that answers my next question. <laughs> are there any fish in there? Well, evidently there are, and the salmon leaping is a welcome sight, one that would have been extremely rare in the early years of Ardnacrusha. It means that the fish lift that allows returning salmon to leap 90 feet without leaving the water is actually working, and it means that Dennis Doherty will have a smile on his face when we come back. Lesser Spotted Journeys, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. You cannot build something of the scale of the Shannon Hydroelectric Scheme without having a major impact on the fish life of that river. And the two species that were most noticeably affected by the sudden imposition of such massive barriers across their watery highway were those whose natural instinct was to come in from the sea and swim upriver to complete the next stage of their life cycle. One is, of course, that aforementioned legendary symbol of knowledge and wisdom, the salmon. And the other is that mysterious creature about whom we still have much to learn, the silver eel. 
For centuries, the greatest minds in the world were completely baffled by the extraordinary life cycle of the silver eel because they couldn't work out how they reproduced. The Greek philosopher Aristotle more or less gave up trying and concluded that they must simply emerge from the earth as fully formed adults. And the great psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, believe it or not, spent much of his early scientific career in the 1870s dissecting silver eels in a vain attempt to find the location of their reproductive organs. It was a vain attempt because the eels he was working on didn't have any, at least not at that stage of their development. A Freudian might say that it was this failure that led him to concentrate on more slippery specimens later on in his career. It wasn't until the 1920s that Danish biologist Johannes Schmidt discovered that eels don't develop reproductive organs until towards the end of their lives, which could be anything between 10 and 35 years at which point the eels have to swim 4,000 miles across the Atlantic to lay their eggs in the Sargasso Sea where they themselves were born. You can be sure that Dr. Dennis Doherty is well versed in all the latest that scientific research can tell us about the silver eel these days. Dennis is a fisheries biologist and he heads up the ESB's quite elaborate efforts to mitigate the impact of the hydroelectric scheme on the Shannon's populations of salmon and silver eels. In the case of the salmon, that involves rearing the fry in this conservation fishery just below Partine Weir, before releasing them as smolts into what's now called the Old Shannon. In other words, the river flow that remains after the bulk of the water has been diverted down to Ardna Crusha. Dennis, you have a number of tanks here. They all have the same number of, of salmon. These are fry in there at the moment? These, these are fed fry, or th in other words, they've just begun to feed. Right. And there's probably about between five and 6,000 per tank. These fish will actually impinge onto this hatchery here, so that when they release the salmon smolts, we fin clip them. There's a small fin on the back of the fish. We clip that off, it doesn't go back, right. and it doesn't harm the fish. We release them to sea, to the river outside here. They come back then about a year later, and they will actually come back into the fish pass here behind us, and into the salmon trap and we will separate our hatchery from our wild fish at that trap. Also, there are wild fish still doing their own thing out there. Wild fish do their own thing, use the fish masses here on the Shannon, uh, and hatchery fish are coming back to this hatchery. Is it possible to say at this stage there have been what percentage of returns that you get, or do you have figures like that? Uh, we do, uh, because the Marine Institute have a, a national program where they tag portions of fish, mm. and uh, we know that probably in between, say, half a percent and one percent of those young salmon smolts that were released from here will actually come back as adult fish. Which isn't that different from a completely natural state, is that the case? Because no. pre predation and all sorts of attrition would, would, would diminish their numbers anyway. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot against salmon, which is why a salmon produces so many eggs. So that's the salmon. Well, ho hopefully they'll be restored to uh, the sustainable numbers and they're not really But you'll keep doing this anyway, really. It's yeah. a mitigation effort that's been going ongoing since 1959 here as in the Shannon. As long as that? Yeah. Right, yep. right, right. So we're doing it quite a while and it's... Mm limited success but that success really is unfortunately the decline of the salmon nationally yeah so you're up against that background as well it were, that's uh, the background uh, and unfortunately uh, we're fighting that battle well you might be pleased to know that when i was talking to alan vane earlier on uh, we we're standing right at the top of the dam and this big beautiful silver fish came up leaping out of the water behind us as if to say look i'm here we're here you know it. Yeah, so <laughs> some, stuff. someone's working, put it yep. that way. I couldn't, I couldn't see whether it had an antipoy spin or not. <laughs> <laughs> the silver eels, of course, can't be raised here, but the efforts to conserve their numbers are no less painstaking. This box here, or which is actually an elver box, or an, an, elver, an elver box, or an elver trap, is here to actually catch as many juvenile eels as possible. We measure the weight of those eels and we release them then above the weirs. And these would be eels that have come in. Uh, At this point here, we're probably about 12 kilometers up Sumalimic City. Right. So we catch quite a lot of what we call bootlace seals. Bootlace seals? About the length of your bootlaces. <laughs> Surprisingly enough. Long, long, thin and skinny. Long, thin and skinny. And they will be up to five years old. So two, three, four years old. Right. And they would have lived those years coming up to this point. So they have a very complicated life, life cycle, don't they? I yes. Mean, they start off as, well, start off as eggs, as we know. Yeah. Way across the Atlantic and the Sargasso Sea, four or five thousand miles away. And when they when they come out of those uh, eggs, they make their way across the Atlantic. They drift back in the, the North Atlantic drift, or the Gulf Stream, uh, and they're called leptoke. So by being flashed, they can use that ocean current. Right. They drift back, and whichever coastline they come to, they go up the nearest freshwater. Oh, so they're not like salmon, 
uh, famine will return to, to their, their home stream, as it were, where, where they were born themselves. Yet yeah, there's no homing instinct for eel. So they could land anywhere, any, they could any, land anywhere, any yeah. fresh river yeah. at all. Once they get into fresh water, they would feed. Uh, male eels would go up to about 40 centimetres in length, and they would be about 15 years of age when they're fully mature. And a female eel could be anything up to above a metre in length, and they would be about maybe 19 years of age. So the females take longer and live longer? And live longer. Right. When they do become fully mature silver eels, then their instinct is to migrate back down river again and across the Atlantic to the Sargasso Sea. And this is when the ESB's mitigation programme swings back into action. At that stage, they're actually quite a hardy animal. Uh, so ESB, uh, as part of our mitigation, uh, and it all relates back to the 2009 eel directive, which is the conservation of the eel. But we actually transport, trap and transport those catches of eels above the stations, release them below the stations so that they can undertake their migration. There's an awful lot of work involved in that, isn't there? A lot of work, yeah. So and you, you actually problem. have people employed to catch eels, yeah. not for commercial use, but simply to conserve them. And you put them into some kind of a, a carrier? Uh, uh, we, a have, tank, a tank. we have tanks of water, oxygenated water, on the back of a, either a pickup or a trailer or a lorry, depends on the catch and what size. And this is all to take them around these obstacles? We bypass these obstacles and release them to sea. Oh. So, so it could be one-way traffic, couldn't it? You could be saving the eels yeah. for them to end up as German eels or French eels. Or, exactly, or, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And so, regardless of what nationality the offspring of these bootlace eels will eventually become, we're releasing them on the Tipperary side of the Shannon. But just to avoid any dispute with the good people of Clare and the Firebank, let's just call them European eels.